gentlemen, welcome again to the Chess Gym. This is your host, Renee Phillips. Boy, do we have a great time for you this evening. We are looking forward to journeying to the end of the rainbow, not only the end of the rainbow, we are looking forward to being an integral part of your chess development. Remember, this is an opportunity for you to be spared the disappointment, the frustration, and the humiliation at the board. We want to garner some good chess habits. We, we believe that practice does not make perfect. Practice makes habit. We want to iron out the kinks of a good uh, of poor play and iron out and really hone in on, in on some great techniques as it relates to chess play. We have had the privilege of looking in the chess training journal of none other than chesscoach.net, the great Frank Johnson. Looking forward to uh, employing some of the things that he has placed there. One thing I want to make a note of and pay, pay particular attention to he made mention that one of his training regiments included looking through at least a hundred games a day, master level games, from this week in chess. Now, two things about that. One, I believe the subconscious mind has the ability to take snapshot pictures of myriads, thousands of positions, while the so the conscious mind gets bored, wants to calculate, wants to compute, and so the regiment that includes the looking through a hundred games, even though you don't spend time on the position, but you actually fast forward through the games, allows the subconscious mind to take pictures and snapshots of myriads, thousands of positions that the conscious mind can't can't possibly read or fathom at lightning speeds. So, I'm in firm agreement with that particular regimen. We will actually be able to see the pros and cons, and actually if that was helpful to Coach.net in his endeavor to play well a couple of weeks from now in any tournament that will be held in Atlanta, Georgia. Big tournament. Well, to test out some of the regimen, Coach.net went to a tournament in Birmingham, Alabama, and finished with a perfect 4-0. So if you're looking for uh, kudos, justification, or validity as to whether or not the training regimen he has employed is effective, well, what an illustration, what a commercial, what an advertisement. 4-0. and oh. In fact, the last round was against a 2198. Well, we would certainly like to see the performance rating after that tournament. Thus, without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the game. This was one of the games from that 4-0 and oh massacre that was employed by ChessCoach.net. E4, C5, knight to F3, knight to C6, D4, open Sicilian, C takes D4, knight takes D4, and now the G6 move. Now, I have a very, very familiar story here. We always play knight to F6, and I know someone's saying, well, wait a minute, that move there allows the aggressive E5. Yes, it does, and if you've watched some of our other tapes, you know that aggression unbridled aggression is just beaten backward when you're playing seasoned players who have the opportunity to play and transpose moves that aren't the normal move order or doesn't you know conform to MCO, ECO, BCO oh man come on guess what I know moves and variations and openings and defenses have a place yes they do but they come secondary to employing the sound principles of good chess play such as activating your pieces a being safe with your king b and c centralizing your pieces bringing them to places or squares where they have the greatest range e5 violates one of those principles well yes it is an aggressive push and it looks very aggressive, but it just loses a pawn to knight takes e5. It's just ridiculous. But you know what? You have people that make those kinds of moves. So, having said that, now knight to, I'm sorry, instead of knight to f6 here, most players, if you're going to play the accelerated dragon, play c, e, g6. Now, the funny story I have here, um, g6, Wojo, uh, a very, very, very great player, the late 
Alexander Wozokiewicz was one of my trainers, and he would always say, well, no, you don't want to allow this, this move, in because if, if you play G6 here, you allow the Marachi. Marachi. You don't want to allow the Marachi. And I said, well, uh... Uh, okay, okay, that's that's cool, well, Joe. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm with you, baby. Hope, but I just need you to take a little, have a little patience. Hold on. Now, explain to me first of all, what is this Marachi, and second of all, you know, hey man, I'm a Viking. I'm not afraid to play openings, defenses. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. I said, well, well, well talk to me. Talk to me. Let me know something, well, Joe. Well, Joe said, he said, when you're playing lesser opposition in the earlier rounds. You want to conserve your energy. You don't want to give the white pieces and the player of the white pieces, even though they're lesser and lower rated, you want to work. You don't want to have them, uh, you don't want to minimize the work and the energy that they have to employ in order to maintain equality. You want to be able to play a opening or a defense, play an opening or a defense that will allow you the opportunity to wrestle the initiative with the least amount of energy and effort that you have to put forward. You want to play things that are trappy, things that you can confuse or transpose the move order so that your tactical prowess can come through. And allowing this particular variation, the Marachi, or as I thought it was termed, the Marazzi bind, the Marachi gives white a positional plus from which black has to work extremely hard to wrestle the initiative. If white does not desire to mix it up and white is content with just having a slight positional plus and plays solid moves, Black will be forced in order to, in order for Black to win, net the win. Black will be forced to take chances, to take risk, and to compromise his position in order to give the game an imbalanced feel or touch in order to win the game. And Wojo said that there are easier ways to do this other than allowing the Morachi. After c4, white has a death grip on the d5 square. And now this is the beautiful thing. I've also trained with Roman Genji Hashvili, and he's a friend of mine, and he's had several tapes, and Roman actually goes through the tapes, and he gives you lines to play against the Morachi. In fact, he has some deadly lines. And so, I've played, I've essayed the uh, uh, Sicilian Dragon and the Accelerated Dragon, and I've since abandoned it because I found both Grandmasters' assessments of the position to be true. One, Romans advocates if you're going to play the Accelerated Dragon, you need to be prepared for the Marachi Bind or the Marazzi Bind, and Black will have to play for levers such as b5, d5, and I've even seen of late levers for f5 to wrestle the hold from white that he has on d5. That hold is solidified by these pawns on c4 and e4, and so thus levers are pawn battering rams that will be hurled at the c4 pawn and the e4 pawn, either from f5, d5, or b5. The resulting breaks will give, will loosen that pawn structure, give black good peace mobility, and white will have to be, white will be distracted attempting to defend the loosened pawn structures while black gets good peace activity. Well, enough rhetoric, enough said there. Black plays bishop to g7, bishop to e3, knight to f6, knight to c3, defending the e pawn, black castles, bishop to e2, d6, pawn comes in the center, and now the castle. Both players have castled, they've activated their pieces A, they've being safe with their king by castling, bringing both kings behind a wall of pawns. In the case of black, behind a wall of pawns and a bishop at g7, a fianchettled bishop. And c, both players have developed their pieces, albeit their minor pieces, towards the center. 
and have placed them on squares where they have the greatest range. Black plays bishop to d7, white plays rook to c1, and queen to a5, and here we have pretty much, pretty much a docile yet book position. This is one of the positions that will result from the Marachi bind first 10, 12 moves, where I think pretty much it's safe to say you're probably still in book here. But the difference between the two players is very, very uh, deep. There's a stark contrast between white and black, and not just the rating, as you will see by the next move. White plays B3, and guess what? Maybe a book move, I don't know, I, when I ran the game through the uh, Fritz and crafty and looked at the different analysis you know some of the various sub variations gave b3 but let me stop here let me pause here and give you a little chess gym information first of all we train people to be combatants spartans warriors on the board fire on the board yes we want to make sure that there's not only fire if you can put a flamethrower on those squares that's what we want to teach we want to teach combative chess and to have proper thinking winning is not a sometime thing it's an all the time thing winning attitude not a sometime thing it's an all the time thing baby and b3 People will say, hey, Coach Renee, why are you tripping off of B3? Well, I'm tripping off of B3 because white has a spatial plus. White has the advantage. White has no, there's no need for a prophylactic uh, positional move here. Hey, man, it's time to get the guns blazing. Here you have options of F4. There are several options. No need to place more protection on the C4 pawn. I, I mean, Maybe it's just me. Let me get my glasses. Is the C4 pawn being attacked right now? And even if it was, are you kidding me? Why Why would we want to capture the C4 pawn and release that file, for, open that file for the rook? We don't have a rook there yet, nor do, can we thwart the range of the white bishop. The C4 pawn is helping us at the present you know is is actually hindering white at the present yes it's aiding in the bind on d5 but to play b3 for what reason uh maybe he's planning on backing a bishop up and fian kettling on the queen side no i i have no idea b3 looks like a static position memorized variation move to me the player now knows that he's out the book He's playing a higher rated player, and so now instead of devising and coming up with a plan, he wants to play something that he feels comfortable with based on some position that he possibly has seen in the opening book. And then, man, let me quit hating. Let me quit tripping because that may not be the case at all. But B3 looks pretty passive to me. Now, I've, been got, I've gotten beaten by experts and 2,100 players who have played the Morachi bind, and I found what Wojo said to be true. It requires too much effort on Black's part. If you're playing for a win, if you're playing for a win with the Black pieces, to allow the Morachi bind requires Black to really have to overextend himself if he wants active play or compromise some of his position in order to give the game an imbalanced feel and wrestle the initiative from the player of the white pieces. Guess what? I found that to be true and against experts I've seen this particular maneuver. Queen to D2 then if you just develop normally like Rook at A to C8 then comes bishop to g5, and that looks okay too. You play a6, and then all of a sudden, here comes the bomb. Just simple moves. Knight takes c6, bishop takes c6. Oh, great. I have control of e4, and I'm actually contesting d5, correct? Yes, I am. But watch what happens. Bishop takes, bishop takes, and now... The horrifying, oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Let's go back a couple of moves. I'm sorry. I forgot to, uh, to set up one other thing. But here again, bishop, queen of d2, rook to c8. Um, before the knight takes, let's uh, go to bishop to g5, that variation, a6. And before bishop takes f6, 
um, we have the rook to at f to d1. Now upon b5, here's the drama. Here we go. Knight takes knight. Bishop takes c6. Now here we go. Bishop takes f6. Bishop takes f6. And now after the resulting knight to d5, guess what happens? Oh, I can tell you what happens. I can show you what happens. This happens to me in several games. Queen takes d2. And now instead of playing rook takes d2 immediately, there is the intermezzo, knight takes f6 check. After knight takes f6, pawn takes f6, now rook takes d2, and guess what? Yes, yes, hey, no need to even tell you the fights that I have had to go through in this particular position. Now I'm trying to wrestle in an end game, rook and pawn end game, where I'm worse. And it's just ridiculous, especially when you're playing lesser opposition, because just by making normal moves, white can not only maintain, but carry a spatial advantage on into the end game. And so, um, yes, that's one of the reasons why we have, what, abandoned the Morachi and the Accelerated Dragon. We'll leave that for other people and we'll try and play other openings and defenses that will require less energy and less risk to wrestle the initiative from lesser opposition. Thank you very much. I'm glad I was able to get all of that out without stumbling and stammering as I sometimes do. B3, Knight takes D4, Bishop takes D4, Bishop to c6. Now I want you to look at who's dictating things here. It almost seems like chesscoach.net is the DJ and the white player of the white pieces is on the dance floor. Now, the current music genre that's on the on the uh, disc table or on the CD player is that of disco while the player of the white pieces is either deaf or just impervious to the kind of musical genre that's being played. He is line dancing, but there is disco music on the table. F3, this move looks like B3. In fact, you know what? Yep, look at the pawn flannics that White has set up. Now, question. Are you planning on doing anything with that pawn at e2? Oh, no, you know what? That's not a pawn at e2. That's a bishop. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Okay. F3 makes it a pawn. Okay. Yeah, F3 does solidify the e4 pawn. But, hey, wait a minute. Didn't white start off with the first move? Well, bishop to h6. I love this move. This move is novel. I, why? First of all, Bishops don't belong on h6, a6. They belong in the center where they can control and radiate uh, control on the center. But what is novel about this idea, and this is one of the things that I believe has happened as a result of the subconscious mind taking snapshots of myriads of positions going through those games at uh, this week in chess, now the bishop goes to a place that is very unroutine, and yet from the edge of the board, the bishop radiates influence not just on the center, but rakes across white's position and virtually cuts it in half. Watch what happens after rook to c2. Now, White has the opportunity to trade pawns, I'm sorry, trade bishop for knight, double and isolate black's pawns, and what does black do? Black invites it by playing rook at f to d8. And I thought this was very, very interesting. One, because it is, it's novel because of the plans and the strategies and the con concepts that result in the wake of pawn, bishop takes knight, Bishop takes f6, pawn takes f6. Guess what? I love this because now the bishop is no longer at g7, but it is on a diagonal where it rakes across the board. Yes, white has given and saddled black with a doubled 
set of pawns on the F file and an isolated pawn on D6 but who has the advantage here well let's just say you're gonna need a fire extinguisher because there are there there are flames across the dark squares right about now someone get some foam oh no wait a minute this is a grease fire make sure you get the right CO2 for this my goodness I love the plans and I love the thinking of chesscoach.net on this particular maneuver after bishop to h6 white plays queen to d3 oh my goodness are you kidding me don't you have enough pawns I thought you played bishop to e2 because you wanted to replace the pawn that was absent on the d file and now you've given yourself another pawn look at the bishop on e2 and the queen on d3 these are two big pawns yes they fortify you know what man that c4 pawn is really fortified now I don't think black wants to touch that one and you know what the e4 pawn is solidified as well but remember the Marache is a system that allows white a spatial edge and plus with little effort and the hallmark square of the Marache is not c4 we've had several moves to defend that square the hallmark square for the Marachi is d5. Is white going to place a piece, an umbrella, a grain of salt, grain of sand on d5 any time in the game? Will it ever happen? Man, excuse me, hate to be so hard on whoever the player of the white pieces are, but I mean, come on, man, defend yourself. Don't just put your chin out there and let chesscoach.net slap it both sides, behind your head, behind your ears. Man, defend yourself. Put your hand up and block one punch. My goodness, now you're hitting yourself. <laughs> Pawn goes, knight goes to h5, and look at the squares, the dark square complex. Now white can't even play bishop takes knight. Knight to h5 threatening to g f4. g3, the first defensive move that makes sense in this game. It denies the knight the f4 square and the king can come maybe to g2 and give some defense and some aid. Who knows? With all those pawns and queens on the white squares, I don't think black will ever be able to penetrate there, at least not without help. Coach.net goes to a6. Remember the bind and the break. The lever, b5, is the obvious target here. Oh, my goodness. White plays f4. And the reason for this is, okay, well, you know what? I can see why white would play f4. Obviously, there is no reason to thwart the direction and the range of the enemy bishop. I mean, black doesn't have a bishop on the h1 to b8 diagonal, or else if he did, you wouldn't want to create targets around your king and give black target practice. Well, f4 is okay because there's no bishop on the h1 to a8. Wait a minute. Is this a point? Oh, my. There is a bishop at c6. Why would you place target bullseyes around your king by playing f4? Wait, I know why. You're planning on shooting the dead knight at h5. That knight at h5 is awaiting to be put out of his misery. He's gone there to die. The knight at h5 is went. He's gone to the edge of the board, threatening f4 and g3. But he's finding and looking for a place of rest. Please tell me you are not trying to give up a young soldier in exchange for a dying horse. Well, we'll see. F4. Two things softens the diagonal the bishop on c6 now will be having uh, lunch very soon at white's expense now if there were any questions any concerns I had about the moves that black makes this would be one alarm and this is one move that I think um, black could get into trouble here I think now instead of moving the bishop immediately white has the intermezzo move First of all, let me say this. Let's look at 
the things or the atmosphere that makes a combination ripe in this position for white. How many squares are available to the queen? Well, let's look here. Prior to playing e5, the queen on a5 had the run of the board and could quickly transfer to the king side in a moment's notice. After e5, we attack the bishop on d4, but we now cut the queen's range in half. She now only has access to one half of the board, and albeit half of the board uh, that's very, very restricted. She has the b4 square, the a3 square, the c7 square, and I think, yes, that's it. So let's see, one, two, three squares. By playing e5, black has limited the scope of his queen. And so now, white needs to capitalize on the limited scope of the black queen. Black has just now given white an opportunity to get back in the game. b4 here, I mean, just allows a myriad of combinations and exploits the decreased range of the black queen. Uh, one of the resulting uh, positions can look like queen takes b4, knight to b5, pawn, bishop takes, pawn takes, and, um, wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute, I'm sorry, before knight to b5, I'm sorry, knight to d5, before knight to d5, you would have rook to b1. I am so sorry. After rook to b1, um, I don't think it's um, pretty becomes pretty obvious what happens after this so obviously queen takes queen can't take on b4 and if the queen goes to b6 it becomes even further curtains after knight to b5 I'm sorry knight to d5 um, if the, the queen can move but if she if the bishop captures on c6 well naturally yeah it's going to be pretty bad and white would get the plus here but um, those variations are hard to find at the board, especially at accelerated time control. And I'm not saying that blacks loss after b4, but I am saying this would definitely turn the tables with regards to the initiative. And upon playing queen to c7, um, knight to d5 was my suggestion, but that is not necessarily the best move here. Maybe bishop to e3 or bishop to f2, who knows, and followed by knight to d5. But that's something for chesscoach.net to look at. And I we invite uh, some of the commentary and some of the analysis that will go forward from this point. But the game move was bishop takes h5. And let me say this. If you have one bullet, if you have one shot, and you are in the middle of the battlefield and an army is approaching you I think you need to save the one bullet to shoot at the tank yes the bullet may hit the tank and bounce off but guess what I'm gonna take a shot at the biggest force approaching my king and that would be the queen the knight on the edge of the board on h5 that had found a resting plot and a place to die we have just given up a valuable soldier on e2 for a horse on h5 that had gone out the pasture and had been content to die oh my look at what happens after this move well this move loses a piece to begin with in fact I think the best illustration is a live soldier for a dead horse. Bishop takes h5 just loses a piece to a combination here. Watch what happens when black plays pawn takes d4. Three things happen. One, we don't have to capture the bishop immediately. Black doesn't have to capture the bishop on h5 but finds the intermezzo. Instead of capturing on h5 you have the in-between forcing move playing pawn takes d4 now, the first thing pawn takes d4 does, one, it captures a piece and exposes 
the bishop on h5 to the long range queen on a5. That's one thing it does. It captures a piece and opens the range for, reopens the door for the queen to be able to quickly transport, transport back to the king's side. That's number one. Two, the second thing pawn takes d4 does is now it attacks two pieces simultaneously with a discovery. The knight on d c3 is attacked with the pawn and now the bishop on a h5 is attacked by the queen on a5. That's two things. But that's just two. We're not finished yet. Hold on. Let's back up one more again. One more time. Now, the third thing that pawn takes d4 does is now look at the range and the open e file the queen now the new diagonal for the bishop regardless to what takes on d4 if anything takes this game now has gone from being closed to an atom bomb the whole position is about to explode now white has two pieces under attack and yet he has one move. Can you move both pieces under attack with one move? Well, I don't think so. Not according to the rules of chess. The Desperado, Bishop takes g6, H takes g6, Knight to d5. Oh my goodness. Where have you been all game? The whole purpose behind the Marachi, what gives it its flavor, what gives it its poison, what gives it its bite is the control of the d5 square. Knight on d5 lights what out? Black has to totally, practically compromise his position to wrestle the initiative from the white pieces in the Marachi bind. Yes, I'm sure there are ways to do it, but guess what? I haven't been successful. Just because I haven't been successful, you deserve the right to try. All of the players out there, hey man, don't take my word for it. Take some opportunities, experiment with the Marachi from both sides, and let's see what we can come up with. Let's see how you fare out. Knight to d5, obviously bishop on c6 is going to take the Clydesdale horse at d5, and the resulting position is just murderous. Now, rook to e8. Rook to D, E2. Now, very good teaching moment here. I think ChessCoach.net has heard some of the videos. Watch this next stellar move. Oh, great. You mean to tell me Black didn't just exchange Rooks on E2 because he had the opportunity exchange? No. You know the rules of the chess gym. You don't exchange pieces unless the resulting position does what? favor you. That's exactly right. Just because someone invites an exchange or offers an exchange of pieces doesn't mean you're required to exchange. You exchange when the resulting position favors you. The rooks are uh, contesting each other on the e-file, chesscoach.net. Remember, when you're ahead in material, blacks up a piece, you want to shun the exchange of pawns and invite the exchange of pieces albeit invite the exchange of pieces when the resulting position favors you. Both rooks on the back rank are protecting each other and are connected unlike the white counterparts on F1 and E2 and so black plays a brilliant, great, <laughs> a great consolidating and not just consolidating, uh, liquidating move. Black allows and invites the counter exchange of queens if white plays rook takes e8, rook will take on e8, and look at the resulting position. Now it is black on the open file with offering the queens to exchange, as opposed to this position where if white play, black plays bishop, rook takes e2, queen takes e2, and now white is in control of the file. And just by employ one simple uh, nuance, uh, one simple tactic, only exchange when the resulting position favors you. Chesscoach.net, we give you an A for this effort, baby. This is plain chess. This is the ABCs of chess, chess gem style. Queen to C3 is a stellar move. Inviting rook takes rook where the resulting position would leave 
black with the open file. Queen takes c3, d takes c3, rook to c2 to stop the pass pawn. Oh my goodness, bishop to g7. Somebody threw on a towel. There's lots of blood all in the ring here. Rook at a to c8. Guess what? The next pawn falls. The pawn at c3 is no longer a pawn. It is a beam. Great, great effort by chesscoach.net. Guess what? I'm so excited after this game. I think I'm going to look at 100 games from this week in chess. Win tonight. Very good, chesscoach.net. We look forward to the next tournament, the next games. And remember, we want to be an integral part of your advancement towards chess mastery. we got to get out of here. I'm sorry we took so long, but I wanted to do some things with regards to teaching and explaining some moves, strategies, plans, and ideologies.